Hello, everybody. This is Sherry Flash. And Ginger, I am going to say your last name wrong because I always do. So pronounce it for me. Well, I got married four years ago, so it's Downey. D-O-W-N-E-Y, Downey. It's really easy now. <laughs> I can say that one. This is Ginger Downey. Yes, easy. Um, she is with Dermamed Solutions, and that's one of my favorite companies. You know they're on the EC website. We are going to be doing a webinar today. Ginger's doing an excellent presentation on a holistic approach to managing acne, and this is super important. I'm sure that a lot of your clients during this time off might have been experiencing some stress and they could be having some flare-ups and they're going to look to you for guidance, whether it be products, treatments, and when you get back into your practice, you're going to have to deal with a lot of that. So this is going to be a really good way to kind of help you help your clients do it holistically. And of course, we could not do a webinar or a Zoom room without having something fun to give away. So as usual, we're giving something really nice on. You're gonna like this one. This one is the Dermamed Solutions Gly 10 Glycolic Lotion, which if you know me, I've said this before, I love glycolic acid. I like using it in moisturizers, day creams. I like it in peels. I just think it's a really good exfoliant. Um, I am a little bit resilient and oily, so glycolic is excellent for me. Um, three of you are gonna win this, and the way you're going to enter to win this is You'll take a photo of you taking this class, do a kind of a snappy selfie, whatever, post it on the Esthetician Connection Facebook group page and use the hashtag EC Loves Dermamed. And that is going to help us look for it. So EC Loves Dermamed um, on the Facebook group page, photo of you taking the class and three of you are gonna win the Gly 10 lotion, which is super exciting. Ginger, we've already got people coming into the webinar. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. We've got Ginger Downey here with Dermamed Solutions doing a presentation today in our EC Zoom room for a holistic approach to managing acne. And three of you lucky viewers are going to win the Gly 10 lotion from Dermamed. And I'm trying to get this into view. There you go. And all you do is take a photo of you taking this class, post it on the EC Facebook group page, and use the hashtag EC Loves Dermamed. Ginger, with that said, we've got people still coming in, but they're going to be able to catch up. If you missed the beginning of this or any parts of this, it's going to be on the EC uh, YouTube channel for you to watch a little bit later. Or if you want to review it, you can also watch it a little bit later. So don't forget to enter to win. Ginger, I'm handing this over to you. I want to thank you very much for coming on today. I sincerely appreciate it, and I'm looking forward to the class. Thanks, Sherry, and, and thanks for inviting me because it's really, um, it's been a pleasure during this downtime downtime to um, really focus on some education. So um, I think this is a great time for all of us just to think about continuing our education and learning and um, doing that during a time where we're not so stretched. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen so that I can go ahead and share the presentation. I'm just bear with me one second. Okay, and hopefully you all see a slideshow in front of you that says integrative approaches to acne management. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ginger Downey. I am one of the co-owners of Dermamed Solutions. Um, and I am, um, I've been with Dermamed Solutions. We purchased the company, uh, my partner Mark Pinsley and I, back in 2011. And we've been at this for a while, just kind of learning and exploring um, this whole market with all of you. And it's been really exciting. So a little bit about me, um, I'm a clinical nutritionist by training. So that means I have my bachelor's in food and nutrition. I have a master's in clinical nutrition. I went on to become a certified nutrition specialist, which took another um, thousand hours supervised clinical practice and an exam and all kinds of fun stuff. Um, so I did that. And then in the past two years, I've been studying a brand new field called nutrigenomics. Um, and so I've kind of added that to my tool belt. And I feel like I've got um, just a really unique now set of um, skills and training that I use both in my clinical practice personally and my work with the American Nutrition Association um, as a volunteer, and then also in my work with Dermamed. So I hope that today when we talk about integrative approaches to acne management, I'm able to give you kind of a new lens about um, treating acne that is not just topical, it's not just mechanical, it's not just lifestyle, but it, it incorporates, incorporates all three. So um, just briefly, um, I already told you about me, I'm going to talk a bit about Dermamed so that you understand like how we take our passion for nutrition and use that in our, um, our products. 
I'm going to talk about the causes of acne, maybe review for some of you, but I think sometimes when we go back to our roots and really dig into, you know, kind of the very science of acne that we have now as enlightened and experienced estheticians, we may have a new view on things. So I'm going to do a little review. Um, we're going to talk very quickly about some mechanical treatment approaches. We're going to talk about some topical treatment options because that's, you know, our passion. Um, and then, of course, nutrition and lifestyle because that's what I'm all about. Love nutrition and lifestyle. Um, for those of you who don't know us, again, Dermamed Solutions, our mission is to uncover the brilliance that comes from comfort in your own skin. And so um, I think that this talk really is aligned with that mission in that when someone has acne, um, it really impacts their confidence. It, it impacts their ability to go out and interact with the world with their shoulders back and really feeling as confident um, and as good about themselves as they can. So some of our core values, um, you know, the reason I, I share these is because I think think that um, when you choose a company to work with, at least for me, I'd like to go and really explore and understand that company to see if their values are aligned with mine. Um, and maybe I have five companies that I could be working with, but there's one that really feels like, you know, they think the way that I do. And so I'd like to share our core values. Um, just quickly, you know, the first one, we say what we do, we do what we say. So we really try hard not to overstate the science or the facts, but just to really state, you know, what is and what the facts are, you know, with integrity. Education, you know, that's what I do. I, I write for our trade journals. I educate at the trade shows. I do webinars. Um, I really love teaching and learning. Um, we also have on our client login for any of our clients an Ask Nutritionist tab where you can ask me a question anytime um, about maybe a challenging nutritional um, situation that you're dealing with. And you, at the end of this presentation, I'll give you my email address. And so you can always reach out to me that way through social media. We're easy to find. So safety, we really do endeavor to keep our, both our staff and ourselves safe and our customers safe. Sustainability, um, we believe caring for the planet is a moral obligation, so we contribute to various funds to offset our carbon um, use. <clears throat> We're looking um, in the future for different ways that we can improve our packaging, et cetera. And science, this is the biggie. <clears throat> we endeavor to make sure that our claims are backed by credible science. And so everything that I share with you today um, is really based on my understanding, my digging into the science. I'm not saying I'm always 100% perfect or right, but whatever I state to you, um, I can back up with you know, some research. I've looked at the science. So we put that all together and we like to think of ourselves as the holistic provider of skincare solutions. So we do equipment. Uh, the Mega Peel probably is the, the thing that most people know, the Oxygeneo, um, IPL, topical treatments, um, our skincare line, and then nutrition, the education. So DM Skincare, um, we have both a back bar and retail product lines. We utilize green chemistry, which means we do our best to use botanical ingredients in, um, as our actives. Also, our products are paraben, phthalate, sulfate, petroleum-free. We don't um, use um, preservative, chemical preservatives like parabens or artificial fragrance or dyes. And I think that as we begin to dig into this subject, um, I'll let you as to why I think that's really important. We offer integrative uh, both machine and skincare treatment protocols. Um, and the other thing is we feel like we have proven results because we use our key ingredients in very high amounts. So if the science says that 3% endothelial oil is needed to reduce the redness associated with rosacea, then that C-difference lotion is going to have 3% in it, even though that may not make us the, the richest skincare company <laughs> because it's expensive to make products. I feel like um, it makes our products really um, stand out in the market, and it's a differentiating factor for us. So right now I know we are all like in the midst of a really stressful time. Um, we want to continue to serve our customers and make money, but we can't be in physical contact with them. So um, right now we have instituted a drop shipping program for um, our wholesale clients like you. So you can create revenue from home. You can reach out to your clients. You can do um, you know, Skype or Zoom um, sessions with them. And then we can do drop shipping at an 8% flat um, shipping fee which is nice. So even if there's a product that you don't typically carry in your um, retail space, we can drop ship that to your customer if we want to create a protocol. Um, we have some very interesting ones like butt facials. <laughs> facials. Um, so we can um, share those protocol ideas with you if you want to be creative with your social media and try to do some selling from your couch. Also um, today for, um, and 
through the 5th of May. We have a special for Esthetician Connection members only. That's two of our professional products, our Glide Gel Cleanser and our Glide 10 Lotion. Um, Sherry is giving away the smaller size of that um, as a prize. But you can buy both of those for $80, which is a $20 savings, um, and there is free shipping on that. So um, we will talk a little bit about Glycolic, which is really a, a validated tool for um, helping people with acne. All right, so let's dig into our subject. Now that I got all of that housekeeping out of the way, I wanna dig into our subject. I um, also want to let you know, if you have questions, you know, we will collect those in um, the chat or the q and I'm not sure exactly. I think they said it would be in the chat. And then at the end, I will go through all the questions for you, um, as many as we can handle during the time that we have together. Hey, so, Jen, you're, yes. we're gonna try to take those questions in the Q&A app. Oh, perfect. On the bottom okay. of the screen for the participants. Perfect. Okay, Q&A app. Use that. Um, we will get to your questions at the end. Whatever I can't answer, I can always follow up later um, in an email to all of you. Thank you for that. Okay, so acne. It's a very complicated subject, isn't it? Um, acne is caused by a malfunction in the pilosebaceous unit, <laughs> and we can dig into that a little bit in a, a, an upcoming slide. I'll show you a picture of it. Um, but really, acne occurs when the hair follicles become plugged with oil and dead skin cells. And these hair follicles are connected to the sebaceous unit, glands. And these glands secrete an oily substance known as sebum. I'm sure we've all heard of that. And it lubricates both our skin and our hair. And it normally travels up through the openings of the hair follicles to the surface of the skin. But when the body produces an excess amount of sebum and also dead skin cells, these can build up and they can form a plug. And we know that plug can take different um, forms, right? So if the follicle wall is bulging, we might see a whitehead. Or the plug may be open to the surface um, and it turns black and that's a blackhead. Again, you probably all know this, but I'm just reviewing it to keep it on the back of your mind. So pimples with res red raised spots and a white center um, develop when the hair follicles become inflamed or infected. Those are the nasty ones. And probably um, the toughest ones are those blockages and inflammation that are deep inside the hair follicle that produce these cysts beneath the skin. So that's that really inflamed cystic acne that we see so much. Then we also have the pores in the skin, which are the openings that allow the sweat glands to release um, you know, fluid and um, waste through our skin. And those typically aren't involved in acne, although when we have excessive sweating and we're not cleaning that away, we will see that um, we have an increased incidence of acne. And we see this a lot in athletes, for example, up on their back when they are wearing shoulder pads and they're sweaty and they're not cleaning that away quickly. Um, also, when people aren't changing their pillowcase, et cetera. So we have these three main causes of acne. One is the overproduction of sebum, sebum which we'll um, talk about you know, why that might happen, um, bacteria, and also the inability of the body to shed the dead skin cells. And so there's a few inputs we're gonna to explore today. Um, we're gonna to talk about hormonal inputs, you know, kind of these androgens that increase sebum. We're gonna talk about nutritional inputs, so high glycemic foods, um, hormones in dairy and meats, um, and also things that trigger inflammation, such as imbalances in the type of fat they're eating and uh, compromised flora. And so this pilosebaceous unit is actually part of the immune system. You know, I thought that was really an interesting little tidbit that I discovered in my research. So I really like this graphic uh, because it takes a lot of the things that I was just describing and it gives you a little bit of a picture of what that looks like up close. Again, review, but you know, let's just keep this all in mind as, as we're going through the talk. So this um, pilosebaceous unit, it's a really active little um, unit or cell, right? So the channel is also a transport mechanism for substances like water, um, air, oxygen, um, nutrients, and hormones. So it's actually part of the immune system in that way. That's the way that it is part of the immune system. So a lot of good stuff occurs here. So let's begin about talking about some of the physical or um, mechanical, as I'm talking about it here, treatments that we can use to treat acne. So IPL, or intense pulse light, delivers a really concentrated um, blast of light or energy at a certain depth to the skin. And depending at the depth at, depth at which it is penetrating, it can target either um, pigment, hair, um, pigment, hair, or bacteria in this case. So, you know, we're 
at certain wavelengths, we can inhibit or kill the P. acnes bacteria. And that can work in either um, the 400 or spectrum red light or the 600 spectrum blue light. And so by doing monthly treatments with IPL, we've seen some really um, successful improvement in acne. Do I think that IPL is the only tool in, that you could use to um, treat acne? No, I think it has to be combined with other things. But there's been some really um, great science showing that it is a great way to go after that bacterial cause of acne. So as we go back to that slide about how it's caused, so we're not talking about the hormonal, um, but we are talking about the bacterial causes of acne because it is going after that P. acnes um, bacteria. Secondly, we use microdermabrasion. Of course, as I remember, we love microdermabrasion. You know, we think that is the hammer in your toolbox, um, and it is just a really great beginning point for so many protocols, and there's just very few settings where it can um, offer some benefit when used um, properly. So the idea with microdermabrasion and acne is, well, twofold. Number one, we talked about, you know, one of the causes of acne is when the dead skin cells get um, trapped, you know, and these, these clogs occur. So the bacteria gets clogged with the dead skin cells. So by exfoliating the epidermis, we can keep those, um, those pores open to facilitate extraction or release of the bacteria and the clogged, the dirt, the oils, whatever gets stuck there. The other really beautiful thing about microdermabrasion is once you have a client who has terrible acne scars, it's a wonderful treatment for stimulating collagen and reducing that scarring. Um, and we've seen some great results, which I'll show you a picture of in just a moment. So typically when we're working with someone um, on microderm with microdermabrasion for acne, um, we will do treatments every two weeks. Um, and typically we will combine that with some kind of a 30% acid to peel, which we'll go into a little bit later on. So the last category I wanted to talk to you about was light therapy. Um, and I think that photodynamic light therapy has really um, come a long way, um, especially when we're utilizing certain photosensitizing agents. And so you can use um, red light and blue light, and they each have their benefits. And I think um, in my research, I've come to learn that a combination of red and blue light used together is really um, the best way to go. Um, and this can be done up to two times per day. It's really non-invasive. Um, there are several companies that create, um, have handheld devices that can be used at home. So you can do some of this therapy in the treatment room, but then you can also send someone home with a handheld device and have them while they're watching TV or you know, scrolling through their Facebook, whatever it may be. They can be using this light therapy. Um, and again, what this is doing is going after that bacteria and it's helping to um, keep the skin basically clean of the um, bacteria. I have a note here about being sure to replenish flora and I'm gonna go into this in probably more detail than you'll care to hear by the end, but the most important thing to think about, um, whatever we are doing to the skin, we have to remember that we are stripping away benef beneficial bacteria. And so I'm gonna tell you why that's important in a few upcoming slides. Some before and after pictures um, that we have in our library um, that I think are, are really wonderful. So you see here the, um, the person at the top had a series of five megapeel microdermabrasion treatments um, and that would have been combined with a glycolic peel as well. And it's just giving really beautiful clearing of the skin. Down below, um, it says on the side two IPL treatments, but that is not, that is three IPL treatments. Um, and again, they are spaced a week or two weeks apart. But again, you can see that just by kind of killing off the bacteria with that light energy, we're able to really help the skin. The beautiful thing about IPL is if um, that person also had some fine lines and wrinkles that you could also be um, stimulating collagen and treating those as well. So it, it kind of gives you two, two benefits in one. Next, um, so I'm so excited about the gut skin brain axis and I give um, an entire talk about this because I think it is just so amazing um, how far we have come with this understanding of the connection between our gut or our digestive system, our skin and now even our brain and our mood, really fascinating. Um, and so as skincare professionals, I think you all recognize the connection with a, someone's lifestyle style choices. So someone who is not eating a healthy diet, someone who's not sleeping well and is stressed, um, they typically have poor skin. They typically have some kind of inflammatory skin conditions that go along with that. Um, so the scientists that have barely been studying this have found a common factor in all of these areas. And that is something called substance P. 
Now, substance P, it's different from the P acnes bacteria. I know this gets confusing with the letter P, but substance P is a neural peptide. It's produced in the gut, in the brain, and in the skin. Um, and it really does um, play a role in all kinds of um, health conditions oops, associated with the skin. Poor gut bacteria promotes the release of substance P. So this is fascinating to me. So by maintaining adequate and healthy um, gut bacteria through good nutrition, which we're going to talk about, and healthy probiotics or live good bacteria in your gut, you can um, inhibit the release of substance P and reduce your incidence of inflammatory skin conditions and also acne. Really fascinating. Um, there's been studies in um, Russia, in fact, where 54% of acne patients have significant alterations in their gut flora and a similar one in um, China. So we're getting some real science to prove that the amount of bacteria in the gut is indicated um, in the condition of your skin. I really like um, this sentence and that's why I put it on a slide all by itself because I really want you to listen to it and, and think about what, what the message is here. So your skin's barrier is a biofilm that allows for endogenous microbes to flourish and play the role of protectors against bacteria, viruses, and other microbes. So essentially, our skin is alive and crawling with bacteria. And it's mostly good bacteria. It's protective. Um, as we all know, our skin is our largest organ and it is one of our um, immune, it's part of our immune system. And so our skin is protecting, it's this shell protecting everything on the inside from being invaded by um, toxins and, you know, an imbalance of bad bacteria. So I, I just recently read something that said that they tested the um, bacteria on someone's left hand and the bacteria on someone's right hand, that's on the skin of their hand. And there's actually like a 60% variation in the type of bacteria that's on the left hand compared to the right. And I found that to be fascinating. So think about that. There's probably a very different microbiome that lives on your hands than what's on the bottom of your feet, than what lives on your face, and I bet even your forehead as opposed to your chin. Um, and so when we think in that way about how complex this microbiome is that lives in our skin, I think it deserves a little bit more attention than it's been getting. Um, and so I think that we really need to be mindful when we're choosing our skincare products or we're doing treatments that whatever we strip away, we're going to want to think about replacing or nourishing just as we do with our gut. So think about um, what happens to someone when they take antibiotics. So say you've got strep throat or, you know, ear infection or something, and your doctor prescribes a round of antibiotics. Now, if you're like most people, um, there's usually a consequence. So diarrhea, yeast infection, you know, some kind of tummy trouble. And that is because um, the antibiotic, which is antibacterial, kills off bacteria. But it's not always selective to kill off just the bad guys, and it typically kills off some of the good stuff, too. So when you take an antibiotic, typically you'll strip away some of your beneficial bacteria that lines your, um, your GI tract, and especially in your gut. And so what do we do after we take an antibiotic? The doctor always says, okay, when you're done with that course, you should probably take a probiotic. Well, what I suggest to people is when you're taking an antibiotic, if you take the antibiotic in the morning, then at night or you know, in the afternoon, at least several hours apart from it, I want you to take a probiotic pill or um, really focus on eating those foods that are um, fermented or full of healthy bacteria like yogurt and kimchi and sauerkraut and all those, those good things. So bacteria, it's not all bad and we need to be very mindful about what we do um, when we strip away or kill our bacteria. So along these lines, um, there's this brand new um, area of study, very similar to the concept of leaky gut, where damage to the small intestine allows bacteria and intact proteins to pass through. And when that happens, we suddenly have all kinds of adverse reactions to food and allergies and intolerances that we've never had before, and all kinds of bloating, discomfort, et cetera, because we have thrown off the natural balance of things. And we've thrown off the natural balance of things to the extent that now physically, um, these tight junctions in the gut now have become open and it's compromised, right? This protective um, mechanism of a tight junction is now compromised. And so things are passing through that shouldn't be passing through. 
So an example, um, maybe you've never been allergic to eggs before in your life, but now you have leaky gut um, and the egg comes through as an intact protein instead of broken down into its individual little amino acids. And your body says, what the heck is that? I don't recognize that. I know, you know, the nine amino acids that are in that egg, but I don't know egg, you know, what is this? And so the body says, well, we better just, you know, create a way to fight that off. So we're going to create an allergic reaction or immune response to that egg passing through. So the same thing happens with um, the skin. It's pretty fascinating. We're, we're starting to learn that the skin is the, the primary barrier to toxins, bacteria, and allergens. Um, and especially if we have really um, high water loss, so trans epidermal water loss, um, TEWLs, like the acronym we all see all the time. Um, that moisture barrier, when that gets compromised, we have ev an even greater um, weakening of that barrier. So not only do we weaken our skin through overstripping it or using products that have really harsh chemicals, um, but we can also damage our skin just by not moisturizing enough. So let's think about what's going on right now. Um, I, I've never been a fan of hand sanitizer, but yet there's one in my purse now because when I'm out of the store and I cannot wash my hands, I've got to be able to apply something to kill any um, germs that I may have come in contact with. Not only that, we are all washing our hands for two rounds of happy birthday, right? I, I'm literally sitting there singing the song. I've got to come up with a better one. I notice my kids are doing it too, but we've, we've got to do this to protect ourselves from the coronavirus. So not only are we stripping away our healthy barrier, but we're also using antibacterial soaps and, and um, chemicals on our skin. Hey, in a, in a bind, I'm taking a Lysol wipe and I'm cleaning my hands with it. Um, so what we're doing is we're allowing toxins to come in. And what I'm seeing in my practice, um, I just got a new client this week, someone who has terrible hand eczema. Um, and I'm not a dermatologist, but eczema can be treated also through um, nutrition and also because I have the skin background, I'm working with this client. So let's just keep this in mind, you know, that we have leaky skin um, that can lead to all kinds of damage. Um, substance P, that neuropeptide that I was um, speaking about earlier, is also um, something that is found in the skin and in much higher amounts when we have this condition, which is now called leaky skin. Um, so we need to fortify the skin with healthy bacteria, just like the gut. So how do we do this? Um, Believe it or not, topically applied probiotics. It's going to sound, um, you know, a little crazy, but you know, we thought leaky gut was crazy 20 years ago. People thought we were all, um, you know, it's a big hoax. This this whole concept of leaky gut. But what we've learned um, through the study of, um, in particular, the facts I'm I'm sharing with you today, um, where this study was done on lactobacillus. And so we have found that um, lactobacillus applied topically to the skin acts as a protective shield. So it actually creates a bacterial interference um, that interferes with the bad bacteria, triggering the immune response of redness and inflammation. So it's almost like a shield. That's why I have that picture there. Um, certain strains of bacteria, good bacteria that we can put in skincare, like lactobacillus, can poke holes in the bad bacteria and kill it. So it's almost like we've got an army. I wish I had a sword there too, because that's also what's happening. And then in addition, um, topical probiotics have been shown just to reduce the threat reaction, that, that signaling that happens like in rosacea, for example, um, and it just offers a calming effect. So um, in our line, we have our VitaClear serum, which I think is a daily must for everyone. Not only does everyone need vitamin A every day um, for both acne and anti-aging, but I think that pro and prebiotics are so important as an, an inflammation manager and also just as a fortifier of the skin. Um, now, I know some people um, will make yogurt masks, and I think that's fine. Like I think however it is that you can get these probiotics onto your skin, I think it's a really good idea. Um, and I have been using my VitaClear serum on my hands. Um, and I'm telling you, if I didn't have VitaClear serum, I think I might even just take some, some yogurt that has active cultures and, and use that on my hands, as silly as that may sound, as a way just to heal. You know, right now we're also dry and, and irritated. So topically applied probiotics are a really, really great thing. Now, when we're talking about acne, we cannot avoid talking about the most popular acne ingredients. I'm not saying that these are ones I recommend, but I think um, we really have to talk about what's out there and what works. And um, if we are trading the benefits of something actually reducing um, the incidence of acne a little for um, maybe we are trading that for something else like, you know, um, 
compromising the integrity of our skin and our immune system. So benzoyl peroxide, everyone knows 2.5% um, over the counter is what we can buy. It is uh, very harsh, right? When I was a teenager, this is what I used in that little tube. I had a pimple, I would dry the hell out of that thing. You know, and I'd wake up in the morning with, I still had a pimple, but I had all this flaky white skin around it. And then I would cake my makeup on top and it was just a nightmare. <laughs> and then they started making the tinted ones, which never matched your skin. So um, I just have to laugh at the things that we do. But benzoyl peroxide is still very much um, recommended by dermatologists. I know when my sons have gone to see a dermatologist, it was recommended to them. Um, and it does work. We cannot say that benzoyl peroxide does not work. Um, I think for me, it's a little too harsh um, coming from my stance of more of a holistic approach to acne management. So benzoyl peroxide, retinols, of course, Retin-A really, really does work. It's great for fine lines and wrinkles, and it really does help with um, acne because it's, it's a comedolytic, which means that it's not comedogenic, but it's the opposite. So it prevents um, that buildup in the pores, which could then turn to acne. Um, it's antimicrobial, it's anti-inflammatory. Um, so now there are so many choices when it comes to retinols. Um, in our line, we use something called Grand Active Retinoid, um, and that is a product that has a really slow um, delivery. So it's not like you have that really super harsh um, red reaction to using something that's um, more time released, but rather you get a really slow and steady release. And I think that's a, a really um, good way to go. AHAs, of course, you know, alpha hydroxy acids, uh, great for cell turnover. They're also comedolytic. Salicylic acid, you know, clinically shown, especially at 2%, which is um, the over-the-counter limit, um, slows that shedding inside of the follicles. Very helpful. Um, I think it's great in appeal. I think it's good, you know, occasionally as an overnight treatment. Sulfur, um, this is not something that um, we use in our product line, but there's plenty of science that shows that it does, um, it promotes drying and peeling. So is it really treating or curing the acne? No, but it will kind of like a benzoyl peroxide, it will dry things up for sure. Um, but it can actually make things worse because it triggers even um, more oil production. Chemical peels, um, we like glycolic, salicylic, lactic, um, pyruvic, uh, TCA, jasmineers, oh, mandelic, another one that really seems to be um, helping with um, acne. Resourcenol is um, an ingredient. Some people don't like it. Some people do. Some people think it's a dirty ingredient. Um, you know, it depends on your stance on that. Resourcenol breaks down the top layer of the skin. And so a lot of people like to use a resourcenol based product before they do a peel, kind of as like a peel prep. As lake acid, um, great for unclogging pores, anti inflammatory, antibacterial. Um, we love as lake acid and we use that in our Claritone serum, which to me kind of doubles as a lightening serum and also as an acne serum. Um, resveratrol, believe it or not, like, you know, the stuff in grapes and wine, um, when combined with benzoyl peroxide, will kill P. acne's long term. But the study that I read was when it was combined with the benzoyl peroxide. So that's your trade off. But alone, resveratrol is a great antioxidant. Um, it's in our hydro repair mask, which I know that Sherry loves and I love as well. Um, it's just such a great ingredient for the skin in general. And then licorice extract, which we use quite a bit in our line um, because of its anti inflammatory properties. Believe it or not, it's an antihistamine. Um, so it can help with kind of irritation in the skin as well, reduces sebum. Um, and also lipase, which is an enzyme produced by the acne um, bacteria. So licorice ex extract is a really um, cool ingredient. We like it. Hope I'm not going too fast. Um, I know I can't see all of you like when I'm in a live audience, but I'm sure someone would speak up and yell at me if I was going too fast. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going at this pace unless you tell me to slow down. So let's dig into things that modulate hormones. You know, we all know that hormones are a trigger for acne. Um, some people believe that when you have acne around the chin, it's typically indicated of a, um, a hormonal imbalance. Um, that could be, you know, I've never found any signs to prove or disprove that. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, um, but a lot of people do believe that and see that. Um, but I find that in, in general, when hormones are off, and this can happen during the teenage years, this can happen again during perimenopause and menopause, um, or when people have certain exposures, that um, they can suddenly have flares of acne. And so let's talk about other things that can, uh, I'm going to go for negatively first, negatively impact hormones. You probably haven't thought about this, but um, there's this category of chemicals called xenoestrogens. 
And these are things that um, look a lot like estrogen to the body. So the body gets faked out by it. And so when it comes in, they're like, oh, that, I think that might fit in the estrogen receptor cell. Let's put that in there and try to turn it. And when that happens, um, we have some negative consequences. And so xenoestrogens come from things like plastic water bottles. Um, boy, if you've ever heard me speak, you know how I feel about plastic water bottles. I wish everyone would just drink from a glass or stainless steel if they can. Um, I have such concern for what is in the water that came from the plastic. Just such great concern for that. So if you all can filter your water through your tap or a Brita or something and um, not drink from plastic water bottles, I think it's really beneficial. Um, pesticides. So another good reason to choose organic versus um, conventional produce is that pesticides are also a xenoestrogen. Lots of research on that. And then also the hormones in dairy and meat. And so unfortunately, um, you know, our food supply is um, raised in such a way that it's in very close proximity with the other animals and many farmers um, will inject their animals with certain hormones, um, yeah, hormones to um, kind of manage disease and illness, et cetera. But in addition to that, even if you bought organic um, dairy, for example, um, think about what milk is. Milk is the fluid that comes from a mother's, you know, breast essentially to feed her baby. Um, and it is naturally um, full of hormones. It just is. Um, and meat as well. Um, there's been a great study on, you know, when a cow is slaughtered humanely versus when it's brought in in a terrible, scary way and the stress hormones are released. It is shown that that goes into the meat and then the stress hormones from the cow go into our bodies and they can have ne negative impacts. So it's so interesting to think about not only are we what we eat, you know, you are what you eat, but you also are what the food that you eat ate. You also are what the food that you experienced um, kind of released into their system. So really it, it fascinates me um, to think about all that. And sometimes it's a little scary. Another negative input um, for hormones is um, phthalates. And these are like the plasticizers that are used in certain skincare products. Um, so a plasticizer is something that makes plastic kind of soft and pliable. And so plasticizers or phthalates are also used in skincare to add texture. Um, so some people use silicone, which is not a phthalate, um, or other ingredients. And some people use phthalates because it's cheap. So our, our line is phthalate-free because um, they are shown to be a xenoestrogen. And parabens, um, boy, I have debated with many people on this in the past. Um, they're like, oh, it's such a tiny little amount of paraben that we put in there to preserve the product. And I just say, why? Um, because we know that resveratrol, vitamin um, C, vitamin E, these are also really great preservatives. And there are so many green preservatives out there that there's just no good reason to use parabens. And if you say, oh, it's just a hair of paraben that's in my product, um, well, think about this. You know, they say the average person um, uses, especially a woman, I think it's a woman, um, just to give the quote properly, uses 17 products before they leave the house in the morning, when, when we used to leave the house. Um, so that was from like, from the time you brush your teeth, shower, so shampoo, conditioner, I don't know, um, mousse. Um, some kind of thing, a blow dry product that you might put in your hair. Then we've got our eye cream, we've got our toner, we've got our cleanser, we've got our moisturizer, we've got our sunscreen, we've got our body lotion, you know, you name it. Average person, 17 products. So if there's a, a just a touch of parabens in each product, I'll multiply that by 17 or whatever your number is. Um, and to me, that's just too much. So that's the bad news. Um, but there are ways that we can modulate our hormones. And some things that we can do um, to modulate hormones are to eat foods that contain something called phytoestrogens. And so these are plant estrogens. So just like the xenoestrogens can also fake out the body, um, so can the phytoestrogens, um, but they can do it in a, in a good way. A beneficial way. And so milled flax is one of the um, my favorites. So when you are you know, having your yogurt or your salad, or I put it in my smoothie, just take up those little flax seeds and you have to grind them to get the benefits. That's why I'm saying milled flax. Um, and there's just some really great phytoestrogens that can help with modulating your hormones in the positive way. And when I say soy, I'm not talking about junk food soy. I'm talking about um, natural, organic, non-GMO, um, healthy sources of soy. So let's think about things like um, miso, um, fermented soy products are really great. So it's a good soy, not like processed soy milk, just to clarify that a little bit. 
Um, so indoles and sulfur sulforaphane from cruciferous vegetables and div supplements. My number one favorite um, supplement slash food recommendation that I offer for people to manage their acne. Um, really, really effective. And I found this, especially in my perimenopausal um, group of women, not only for their acne, but for all kinds of um, symptoms that they are having with um, bad periods and things like that. So cruciferous vegetables are um, like, broccoli, cauliflower, bok choy, so cabbage. So those cabbage-y kind of vegetables, um, Brussels sprouts, yummy. So good for you. So if you can get one to two servings of those in every single day, it is so beneficial. And it's such also a really powerful cancer fighter. For people who are like, hell no, I'm not eating a Brussels sprout. You can't pay me enough to do that. Um, we can use something called DIM. I think it's like diiodal methyl something, long name, um, but DIM is the short form um, supplements. Um, and those can be used. You know, my only caution is if someone is on oral contraceptives, birth control pills, um, I am not sure that that might or might not interfere with any kind of a hormonal contraception. So I put my caution up there. But in general, um, I like DIM. Um, B vitamins. So B vitamins are involved in a million different um, metabolic um, bioprocesses. And so um, really important to, to eat foods that contain the B vitamins. So lots of vegetables and fruits um, and some like nuts and seeds are really full of B vitamins. Some people like to take a B complex. Um, magnesium also involved in all of these pathways that um, really help with our hormone production and also our neurotransmitter, our mood um, hormones and um, chemicals. So like serotonin, for example. So magnesium is, it's, I think we're all deficient in magnesium these days, unfortunately, but um, it's found in nuts and seeds as well. It used to be that we got more magnesium when our soil wasn't so over farmed. But it seems like um, the less rich nutrients our soil is, the less rich nutrients our food is. And so we're struggling with that a little bit as a nation, as a world, I would say. A uh, great source of magnesium um, is um, you can use it topically, which is a great way to do it. Um, an Epsom salt bath is a great way to get some magnesium. So really good stuff. So those are things that modulate hormones. So just digging into um, nutrition a little bit more, I, I like to talk about why nutrition. Um, it's so easy just to say, oh, well, you should eat healthfully, you should eat lots of fruits and vegetables um, because they're good for you and we all know they're good for us. But you know, I wanna dig in a little bit more deeply into that. So why nutrition? You know, how does it work? So you know, my, I like to think of nutrition um, as really that food talks to our cells. So the food that we eat is like a little messenger to ourselves. And so everything we eat sends a chemical message to a cell to do something. Um, and the other thing that I've really learned a lot about in my um, couple of years now of studying nutrigenomics is, you know, this study of SNPs and signals. And so um, we all have our own very, very unique set of DNA. Um, and I, when I'm working with clients, I get at that through like a 23andMe or an ancestry test for, as a cheap way. I get your DNA, your raw DNA, and I crunch it. And I, and I find out like where you have some impairments or some SNPs where things aren't working the way that they should. And um, we know that in the study of nutrigenomics that certain foods can actually change those broken um, pathways and make them work properly. And so um, knowing, you know, personalized nutrition is a beautiful field because just knowing exactly about you and what makes you tick and how you, your cells talk to each other and food talks to your cells can help us to give you really personalized recommendations. So why nutrition? Because, you know, it's the, it's the, um, the information that tells our body to do good or bad things. Um, so food provides the substrate needed to make new skin cells and to fight free radicals. So obviously we need... Um, vitamin C to make collagen. We need iron to make collagen and elastin. Uh, we need protein. If we don't have protein, we're not going to make any skin cells. We need water. Um, you can eat the healthiest diet in the whole world and take, you know, handfuls of supplements. If you are not properly hydrated, that water is not getting delivered to your cells. Um, and so I think it's just you know, like very, very important to make sure that people are not only drinking water, but really clean water. So water that's not full of plasticizers from that bottle of water. It's not full of petroleum from the bottle, plastic bottle, um, but a good filtered water from a drinking glass or stainless steel um, bottle is perfect from your tap. If you can just get a little filter for your tap. 
Um, also, nutrition offers free radical protection. So we are inevitably exposed to toxins every single day of our life, right? We walk down the street, there's exhaust fumes, um, whatever it may be. Someone is, someone's dryer is running and they're using like, you know, really smelly dryer sheets or those things you throw in. Um, that's full of toxins. You breathe that in, now your body's got to figure out what to do with that. Um, the products that you put on your skin. So if you're using products that are heavily fragranced or full of chemicals that are really not so good for you, now your body has to fight that off. And so nutrition is what we use to fight off those bad guys, those free radicals. Why nutrition? Because without nutrition, we can't feed that healthy flora that lives in our gut and, and on our skin. And if we don't feed that flora, we know what happens. We are compromised. Our immune system is, is undefended. Our shield is down. So I think I show this slide at every talk I give, and I'm sorry, I just can't help it, it's my favorite, um, because I just hear all the time this eat the rainbow, eat the rainbow, eat the rainbow. But um, I think if once you really understand why you should eat the rainbow, I think it makes eating the rainbow so much more inspirational. So I'm gonna talk about this slide in every talk. I'm gonna to continue to speak about this slide in every talk, if you don't mind. Um, so phytonutrients are compounds that plants produce to protect themselves from damage. So um, just like the um, apple hanging on the tree in the skin has something called quercetin that protects it from the wind and the rain and the element, elements and the sunshine so that it can continue to flourish. Um, so that compound quercetin gets into our bodies and offers really great antioxidant protection. Did you know that quercetin, uh, just a side note, is one of the most um, positively studied um, plant compounds that are being used to fight um, coronavirus. So really to support a healthy immune system and to help combat the virus. So eating quercetin rich foods is really good for all of us right now. Um, and believe it or not, onions and garlics are full, garlic are full of quercetin, the apple skin. Um, we could talk about that later, but it's a really, really great way for you to boost your immune system during this really challenging time. So, you know, you can look at this at your leisure, but I just wanted to point out, so foods that are blue contain anthocyanins, and these are really good for cell aging and memory and cancer prevention, where foods that are green are really good for your eyes and collagen and UV protection. In fact, can even make like an internal sunblock if you have enough of it. Cratinoids found in the orange and yellow foods, et cetera. Um, the one I really wanted to talk about though was allele sulfides and anthocyanins. So these are found in brown, and um, like yellowy brown foods uh, and white. So mushrooms, onion, garlic, for example, really, really great anti-inflammatory compounds for acne. And so I think, especially those allele sulfides, um, a great rack for your um, acne clients who are having some inflammatory skin conditions would be to get enough um, onions and garlic in their diet. They're really helpful. Also the red foods, so lycopene in particular, which is in cooked tomatoes, um, it's in watermelon, are really great for the skin's moisture barrier. And we talked about that earlier, how you know if you are losing too much water through transepidermal water loss because you don't have a really solid water bar uh, moisture barrier, that you might be more compromised and more likely to get acne and other kinds of um, inflammatory skin conditions. So thinking about having foods that are rich in lycopene, like cooked tomato products and, and watermelon, for example, is one way that we can fortify our skin's moisture barrier. So my favorite slide. Another way that um, the food that we eat contributes to acne is um, because of this imbalance that comes from the inflammation related to eating too much of the wrong kinds of fats. So basically our body um, really needs fats. It's, they are essential and fats are really good, healthy foods. Um, and they are, um, there are two main categories of fat. One is omega-3 and one is omega-6. And so the omega-3 fats are found in the foods like the olive oil and the avocados and the salmon and the walnuts. And they are very anti-inflammatory in their end product. And I think I have a slide, I can show you that. And then the fats that come from vegetable oils um, tend to be the ones that are omega-6 in variety. And both of these are essential for the body. We need omega-3, we need omega-6. And we probably need like two parts omega-6 to one part omega-3. But the standard American diet, the SAD diet, um, for most people, we have 16 parts of omega-6 to one part omega-3. And so what's happening is we have this imbalance of the type of fats that we are eating, which is leading to inflammation. 
and it's causing kind of this this fire inside you know what you see in your practice that looks like this so this slide I, you don't have to memorize any of these words but i just want to show you the end product so omega-3 is over here on the right um, and when when you eat something that has omega-3 fat is it is metabolized down its biochemical pathways to an end product that is anti-inflammatory when you eat omega-6 fat um, its end product is pro-inflammatory so we need some degree of inflammation in the body it's part of um, who we are and how our processes work the problem is we need to have the right balance of inflammatory versus um, anti-inflammatory and, th and that seems to be what's triggering um, acne and inflammatory skin conditions for many so um, speaking about you know healthy fats a few of my favorites um, I'll just flip my pages here my takeaway here is that um, fat is not a villain that it's made out to be, um, but it's all about choice. It's all about making really good choices. Um, and so focusing more on monounsaturated fats that comes from olive oil, almonds, avocado, or those omega-3s from fish oil, um, fish, or actually from flax. Milled flax is another great source of omega-3. Um, not as good as fish, but it, it's good. Um, and then if you choose omega-6 omega fats, there are more beneficial choices to be made. So for example, borage oil and evening primrose oil um, contain something called GAL, GLA, which is anti-inflammatory. Coconut oil, although it's a saturated fat, if you buy the extra virgin non-hydrogenated coconut oil, it's um, a really unique kind of fat called a medium chain triglyceride um, that our body really likes for many reasons. Um, and coconut oil and a compound found in it called monolaurin is another one of those superstars right now in the research um, against COVID. And um, the really cool thing about monolaurin is that COVID, just like mono, if you've ever had mono, is a fat-coated virus. So when you take monolaurin, it basically opens up the fat coating of the virus so your immune system can get in and fight the virus and do a better job at it. So by taking monolaurin, um, it's not that you can present, prevent yourself from ever getting COVID, but if you do get exposed to the virus, it allows your body to clear it much more quickly. So we talk about how some people, um, you know, can be come in contact with this virus and you know barely get a sniffle and they're fine, and then other people, um, because of their genes and the way they're wired or whatever um, other health conditions they have, you know, die. And so. These are all the little details we've been exploring, um, and this is one a really impactful um, measure that we have found could help people, and that is by taking monolaurin supplements, which comes from coconut oil. So um, you won't get the amount you need necessarily from eating coconut oil, because if you ate that much coconut oil, um, you'd be waddling around, it's just too much fat. But not a bad idea to saute your veggies in coconut oil. Um, I actually like it on, if you're, gonna, if you're a toast eater or you know, whatever you like to um, smear butter on, you can use coconut oil and it actually tastes pretty good. Grapeseed oil, um, oh, lecithin, um, comes from soybeans and eggs um, in the yolk. So it's really important to eat the yolk of your egg because that's where a lot of the good stuff is, like choline and lecithin. Um, and it is a humectant. So once again, it's about that transepidermal water loss. And we find that when you eat foods rich in lecithin, that you have less um, water, transepidermal water loss. So it's like your body's own way of maintaining moisture. Um, Omega-3s in particular have been shown to control the production of leukotriene B4, which is a molecule that increases sebum in inflammatory acne. So um, clients who are um, really suffering with inflammatory cystic acne should discuss with their doctors the idea of taking some omega-3 supplements. It was a good high quality one. A little bit more about that healthy, healthy bacteria um, in terms of diet and, and how we can nourish our gut microbiome. We talked about topically how we can apply things to the skin um, to fortify the skin, but I think equally important is fortifying the gut because we know that when the gut junctions are open and our gut is leaky, that then substance P is released and that substance P goes right to the skin, brain, and gut. So um, probiotic um, rich foods are ones you've probably heard of like yogurt and sour cream, um, you can buy fortified products like probiotic milk, which I don't think I've ever had, um, kefir, um, sauerkraut, kimchi, you know, it's all kinds of good probiotic rich foods, fermented foods typically. But 
the other side of the um, the coin is not only do you want to nourish your bacteria, but you have to, um, I mean, supply the bacteria, but now you have to feed it. So believe it or not, the bacteria living in your gut likes to be fed and the food it really likes are high fiber um, vegetables typically, um, believe it or not, or high fiber foods. Some of the best ones um, are asparagus, garlic, um, Himica, if you've ever had that, Jerusalem artichokes, bananas, um, wheat bran or flour for those who can tolerate wheat. So um, really thinking about that. So another really great reason to get your five to seven servings of fruits and vegetables every day are to feed your microbiome. And the research has shown us that for people who eat kind of a sad or standard, standard American diet, which maybe has one or two servings of fruits and vegetables and a very low fiber content, that typically they have a very weak um, microbiome. However, the people who um, are plant-based, meaning I'm not saying vegetarian, but that they focus on eating um, a big portion of their diet from plants, that they have a really um, flourishing microbiome. So just another good reason to eat that rainbow. So let's um, shift over now a little bit to more of lifestyle factors associated with acne. Um, so we know that stress can trigger breakouts, but you know, do we know why? I just want to dig into that a little bit. So when a person becomes stressed, um, the body's um, stress hormone cortisol rises, and that directly triggers the sebaceous glands to produce more oil. And so what happens is when there's too much oil and not enough clearance of the oil, we have the clogging and the collection of the bacteria, which leads to that acne. So um, stress isn't just something that is um, affecting our mood, but it definitely affects our bodies in many, many ways, and especially our skin. Um, in addition, the extra cortisol um, creates a biochemical reaction which depletes your Bs and C vitamins. Now, we know that vitamin C is required for collagen production, formation. So if um, that stress is depleting our vitamin C, we're going to have more wrinkled and sagging skin. So think about the studies of those twins who, for whatever reason, were raised in two separate environments. And one twin, um, you know, they'll take a picture 30 years later, and one twin who had kind of an easy, happy life has a much better skin condition than the person who maybe, you know, was poor, or maybe um, you know, smoked or drank or whatever, just didn't lead a very um, happy lifestyle or a stressed lifestyle where they were um, you know, stressed all the time. So it breaks down the skin, it weakens the skin. Also those B vitamins, um, I think we mentioned earlier that they modulate hormones, right? So if our B vitamin stores are being depleted because of stress, our hormones are being ne negatively impacted, which is triggering more um, acne. So, you know, when you're under stress, it's even more important to eat those colorful fruits and vegetables every day, and maybe even consider some supplementation. You know, those antioxidants are so important. Stress also makes it more difficult for skin to heal because it reduces barrier function. Hey, we've been talking about that, right? So um, stress reduces barrier function, resulting in more water loss and the inability for the skin to repair damage after an injury. And as you know, our skin is our first line of defense from all sorts of environmental toxins, from UV radiation to pollutants. So keeping your skin healthy is critical to overall health. So when we are stressed and we let our skin get um, depleted and, and damaged, um, we eventually affect our health. I'm going to just see how I'm doing on time here. Okay, I think I'm doing fine. We'll have a few more slides to go through, and then I'm going to open it up for Q&A, and I hope you guys have some good ones. Okay, the next area I want to explore is um, sleep and skin. Um, so cell, as we know, cell turnover and regeneration happen during sleep. So if we're not getting adequate rest, we're not giving our body and cells enough time to regenerate. Sleep deprivation also causes increased cortisol production. Here we are again with that cortisol. Um, so we named all of the ways that that affects us, right? So cortisol breaks down our collagen. Cortisol affects our hormones. I mean, and now we're learning that um, melatonin is released during our sleep. We know that. It's the thing that kind of tells us, okay, it's getting dark. It's time for me to go to sleep. And melatonin offsets cortisol. So if we're not getting enough sleep and releasing the melatonin that we need to release, we're not offsetting the cortisol. There's just natural balance that happens in our bodies. 
and I'm, you know, I, I'm throwing in the COVID stuff because I really want you to hear it. Um, there's some really interesting research now about melatonin and COVID. And they are looking at um, why do children not get the disease or get impacted as negatively as adults? And one of the reasons um, that is really popping up in the research has to do with melatonin. So when you're young, you have very high melatonin and you have a great ability to release the melatonin you need during your rest. And um, children typically sleep many more hours than adults. So if the average adult needs six to eight hours of sleep, a child probably needs more like 10 to 12. So there's even more opportunity for that melatonin to be released. And they're finding that melatonin is incredibly um, protective against COVID. Um, the thing about melatonin is if you take too much of it, you will um, mess with your body's own um, biofeedback loop and you will stop producing what you need. So um, the current recommendation, um, and I, there's lots of resources on the American Nutrition Association website. It's called theana.org. There's a whole tab on COVID and everything I'm telling you is listed there too. Um, so anyway, the melatonin, they're suggesting about two milligrams per night if you're going to use it um, and no more. So not 10, not five, but two, two milligrams per night. And we're showing that um, that will really help to offset that cortisol. So it helps with stress and skin and now with COVID. So I think, um, you know, melatonin could be very beneficial for many of us if we are not able to get a good night's sleep on our own. And so ideally, um, you know, when you go through the research and comb through it, here's what they say. Um, we're all different, but for um, an overall recommendation, six to eight hours of sleep per night is ideal. We want the temperature to be on the cooler side. So 60 to 68. Um, not too hot, sticking to the same schedule every day, whether that be, you know, Monday or Sunday. Right now, every day is just day, it feels like. But we want to, when life gets back to normal, um, be on a regular sleep schedule, even if it's the weekend. Um, electronics can really, really interfere with your melatonin production, especially anything with a blue light. Um, so you want to make sure you're putting that phone or that computer down and turning off the TV um, at least an hour before bed. Um, it's so important. Um, it's just a direct line to your um, pituitary gland, which has a direct line to your pineal gland, which is a direct line to the production of your melatonin. So I can't stress this strongly enough. If we can go back to reading a book or um, just not doing anything with blue light and electronics before bed, we can really help ourselves. Um, a protein snack two hours before bed has shown to be helpful, um, as well as no liquids prior to bed about two hours. And again, that's just so you don't have to get up and go pee for those of us who have to do that. Um, and magnesium is great for relaxation. Um, number one, it acts on our relaxation neurotransmitters because um, it's involved in that pathway. Number two, it's a muscle relaxer. So a magnesium soap, which is Epsom salt, throw in a little lavender, beautiful way to end the day and set yourself up for a really good night's sleep, which then supports your skin. We are wrapping up. So um, again, this is another one of my favorite slides because I think it's really important for you to think about this information. So every 35 days, our skin replaces itself. So totally replenishes, right? So our liver takes about a month um, and our body makes these new cells from the food that we eat. So you're, you literally become what you eat if you look at it in that way. Um, and so if that helps you and that helps you in helping your clients just to make these connections to whole foods and, and why that's so important, um, you know, I hope that that's a message that you are taking away today. My final um, just bit of advice, staying within the scope of practice. So um, I'm a clinical nutritionist. I went to school for a really long time and spent a lot of time um, in supervised clinical practice to be able to do what I do. And yet there's still certain states that say that it's illegal for me to practice. So um, this is a really tricky area and you guys know about scope of practice in a million different areas because state law varies for estheticians about you know, what you can and cannot do and the kind of equipment you can use and peels, et cetera. Same thing with nutrition. So I feel like you can make general um, recommendations to your clients. Um, about, oh, it's a really good idea to eat five to seven servings of colorful fruits and vegetables and um, trying to choose different colors is very helpful. You can say, um, studies suggest that omega-3 fats can help reduce um, acne. Studies suggest that eating foods like onions and garlic that have allele sulfides can help you. And you can create a library of information that you give to your clients, um, different studies that you've printed from credible sources, and I can help you with that if you need help with um, creating your library.
That's all within your scope of practice. Um, what's not within your scope of practice is to say, um, I suggest that you take this supplement, you know, X milligrams per day. Mm -mm. You know, that's really greatly outside your scope of practice and you can do a lot of harm if you don't understand someone's genes or you don't understand the medications and the health history of that person. Um, you can really do harm, but you can make really great lifestyle recommendations um, and you can give access to good research that you have found and you can share that. Um, just last little slide. I just wanted you to read this if you wanted to, because um, I, I love Rumi. I think Rumi has such nice, calming, you know, soothing words of wisdom. And I think that when we're talking about um, acne, we're talking about a condition that not only makes the skin look bad, you know, flat out, it makes the skin look bad. It feels bad. It feels uncomfortable. Um, but it also causes a lot of stress. And I think, um, you know, it's really important for people to know, like, whatever is going on in their lives, that, you know, there's always something to be grateful for, and there's always some lesson to be learned. And so I just really, I like this saying uh, about Rumi, and I, by Rumi, and I think um, right now, with all that we have going on, I think it's just, you know, a nice parting message. So I want to read it for you. The guest house. This being human is a guest, is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture. Still, treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. Rumi. So that's the end of uh, my slides. So I can go ahead and take some Q&A. Does that sound good, Sherry? Oh, uh, Amber here. Yeah, that sounds yeah. great, Ginger. <clears throat> oh, great. Um, so first question, I've read that benzoyl peroxide can potentially cause hyperpigmentation. What are your thoughts in relation to that? Um, agree 100%. Um, it's definitely not my first pick and it's not something that we use in our products or that I recommend. So I'm with you there. I notice um, many estheticians recommending supplements for acne. Is there any you recommend? Also, how do you feel about high frequency and oxygen facials to treat acne? Um, so again, I think that there are some really great supplements for acne um, and the ones, did you guys lose my audio? No, we can still hear you. Oh, okay, someone typed. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not. Maybe maybe she lost the audio, but oh, I, sorry about can that. Hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Um, can you put that question back up? I lost my question. Um, so just going back to that question about supplements because there were two parts. So I think DIM is fabulous for acne. I think that omega threes are really great for acne. Um, however, it's not within your scope of practice to recommend them. So I just think you have to be super careful with recommending supplements, but you certainly can come up with some research that says the research shows that, and it, you know, how the omega-3 acts on the sebum, the research shows, and you can show how um, the DIM acts on the, the hormone modulation, and that keeps you safe. Um, so personally, I, I would be very careful as an esthetician recommending supplements, but give information. If you have it, give it. And, and then, the second part of that question was, how do you feel about high frequency and oxygen facials to treat acne? Oh, okay, interesting. Um, I don't, I haven't read any really compelling research on it. So, you know, when there's no research there, I don't ever say poo-poo that because I think the way that we come about with new discoveries is by testing and trying things. So I think if number one, it's a do no harm, then give it a try. And if you see positive benefit, then try to explore where that benefit may be coming from. So to me, um, we know there are many benefits to both of those treatments. Certainly oxygenating the skin brings um, energy to the skin and blood flow, and that's got to be good at clearing out the pores. So what we can do is like piece together in our mind the reasons why that's happening, even though I don't have a study to show you, oh yeah, definitely that works. Um, but if your common sense and your outcomes tell you it works and it's not doing harm, I say absolutely. I definitely see theory that connects with um, benefit there. Okay. Oh, with hormonal acne, what is the best way to handle pregnancy acne? Um, that's a really good question um, because there, and in fact, I did a whole case study, um, which was um, printed in Skin Inc. magazine, I believe it was. And I, if I get the um, 
email list from everyone Sherry at the end I can share that just so I can give a better answer so we did a very in-depth um, examination of we followed someone who was wanted to become pregnant got pregnant and then we followed her through pregnancy and she had terrible acne um, so I have a very in-depth protocol to share about that but um, I think number one really avoiding any hormone inputs from food um, keeping those phthalates, sulfates, um, parabens, all those nasties out of food. So eating organic, eating plant-based organic food is really important. Avoiding dairy, probably a good idea for a pregnant woman. Um, but And certainly eating those cruciferous vegetables like broccoli and um, bok choy and Brussels sprouts and cabbage, but not taking the DIM supplement is important. Um, and also it's interesting with the omega-3, a pregnant woman is going to have to be very careful not to eat a lot of large fish because it could have um, high mercury. So avoiding the omega-3 from that source, but instead looking at a really good prenatal EPA DHA supplement um, as approved by their doctor. And regular facials. Um, Tracy on my team um, was the person who did that um, work with us in preparation for the article. And um, she and I wrote that together and she did an awesome job giving really clean, safe facials to our pregnant friend. Um, and the outcome was beautiful. And I have, I have a question um, related to the melatonin you talked about earlier. You okay. were saying uh, two milligrams. Yep. And because I don't take, um, you know, sleeping medication or anything like that. Like I find myself taking melatonin periodically. And the two that I see in the store are regular five milligrams and then extra strength. 10 milligrams and they're like gummies. I mean, that's it. So I'm like, Oh, extra strength. Like, that'll work faster. Right. So I buy the 10 milligram and you're saying no, no 10 milligram. So if they offer five and they offer 10, should I just cut the gummies off? So you could do that, but actually um, I know of several supplements that have two and I'm saying two, you can go up to three between two and three milligrams. Um, and they're typically mixed with things like L-theanine, which is an amino acid that helps with relaxation um, and sometimes GABA and sometimes 5-HTP. So the one I like is by Natural Factors and it's called Tranquil Sleep. That okay. one's great. Um, Oli, I think it's O-L-I, they have a gummy that has L-theanine and either two or three, I think it's two milligrams of melatonin. Um, there's a third gummy. Uh, I can't think of the name of it, but I could share it later. But there are some out there and typically they're gonna be kind of what I call complex. So they're gonna have the L-theanine, the GABA, the other, maybe a little valerian um, that also helps you relax. And what do you think of the GABA? I, I had, that's awesome. It makes me feel weird. That's why I don't take it. I, I feel like that's the only thing that makes me feel okay. not normal. I mean, you know what I mean, like I can take melatonin and I don't feel like I took it. But when, you, when I take GABA, I almost feel like it's having a drink. Is that okay? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so like interesting. So this is um, where genes are so interesting. So I'm positive that there's a reason in your genes why you have that relax that response to GABA instead of the relaxing response. And typically it could probably be corrected by correcting whatever is making that pathway not spin properly. But since you've noticed that, then you know GABA is not for you, right? Yeah. Um, and because some people, um, it can have an opposite effect. It can be stimulating. Mm -hmm. So, but oh, yeah, I'm the person that takes Benadryl and gets hyped up. I'm, okay. you know, so I do have those reversed. So yeah, yeah, that, that does make sense. That makes sense. One of your detox pathways has an impairment that we could probably, you know, figure out. But for you, and this is so personalized. So for you, GABA is not going to be the answer. But in general, I love GABA. I, I think it's it's a really great like natural relaxation. Before I give talks, I always pop a couple GABA. It just makes me feel focused. Is the other thing it does for me. Oh personally. gosh, I'd get silly. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, that's you, interesting. You have, yeah. to, and that's when why supplements should only be, you know given yeah, or yeah. suggested, you know, through someone who really understands what that's all about, because you never want to start a supplement and then go, you know, drive the car or something, you know, we want to help you do that exactly. safely. That's a perfect yeah. example of something that could easily be recommended. And it definitely alters me in a way that I don't like. So I wouldn't want to take that. So it's a very good point. Very and people point. think it's so harmless. Um, but no, supplements are not harmless. No. Um, I love them. But you know, I've been studying for years. Um, and you have to be careful. Like I couldn't do your job. <laughs> right? <It's> just, <laughs> I don't have your yeah. training. That um, makes sense. And so, we have, it looks like, oh goodness, we have some more in here. Um, should I go? Do you want to help as well with acne as a side effect? For, okay, so I think the question is, so if a person has side effects from a medication they're, they're currently taking that cause acne, 
will those tips help? You know, like for example, I guess anabolic steroids or certain oh, certain yeah. birth control pills like Depo-Vera. Like there's certain things that uh, a patient would take that could actually increase acne flare-ups. How does the the dietary affect when a medication is causing that side effect? I think you can still have benefits, um, but honestly, when um, when the trigger is hormonal coming from medication, so when it's coming from like a, a, a birth control, some form of birth control, and it's acting directly on the hormones, first of all, if I'm having that kind of side effect, I'm probably going to find something else. But if that's not an option, um, you can do all of the things that are non-hormone related that I suggested, right? So we can talk about the topical treatments. We can talk about um, taking the probiotic and the microbiome, but we're probably not going to be able to ever change that hormonal trigger. And I don't think we're going to be able to totally clear it. I think we can probably lessen, but not clear it. Um, so personally, I think if you're having that kind of a reaction and there's some other way that you can um, take a different medication or something. Now I know if you're on steroids because you have lupus, that is just the way it is, right? And we're just going to have to work with what we have to work with. But if it's not life saving, I think I would explore a different option. That makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, uh, there's a question here I really want to answer. Do you recommend live probiotics and do probiotic brands need to be rotated? Love this question. Um, so I do like live probiotics, um, but I like all kinds. So I like the Megaspore probiotic. Um, I like a, bl a brand called uh, Claire Therbiotic and they have all sorts of formulations. Most important thing you can do is every 60 days switch to a completely different blend. So if you were taking lactobacillus, um, for a month, two months max. Now it's time to look at some bifidobacteria. It's time to really change up those strains. We don't want to overpopulate any one um, bacteria. We want to have diversity, really healthy diversity. And what's so great now is our research about what strains help us in different ways has come so far that, um, first of all, I could look at your genes and tell you one that would be good for you. But I could also say, oh, are you prone to urinary tract infections? Well, then this might be a good one for you. Are you pr prone to candida? This is a good one for you. Um, but even given that, I'm not going to keep you on that for more than 60 days. We're going to switch them up. And then maybe you'll get to a point where you can just nourish what you've got with the healthy fiber rich diet instead of having to take a probiotic supplement every day or maybe just periodically you cycle in with one but once you get a healthy microbiome going all you have to do is eat healthfully to maintain it you don't have to take probiotic supplements forever that makes sense that makes sense um, so let me see here. Oh, would these suggestions help with acne on other areas of the body, such as the back and chest? Um, absolutely, definitely, yes. Everything I've said um, absolutely applies. However, in my experience with, um, I'm calling it back knee or chest acne, typically there's something um, happening that is more topical that is stimulating it, right? So I think it, it, we see that more in the athletes. Um, I think women with large breasts who maybe you know collect the sweat in their chest area. So I think you're going to have to really look at lifestyle there as well. Um, so it may just be getting into better practices of removing that sweaty shirt and, you know, cleaning right away. Um, our repair bar is really great for that. I don't know if um, you know about it. I love that bar. Yeah. That's oh. one of my favorite products. My too. And it smells like licorice and I know. it's so oh. yummy. Yeah, That's I love funny. Repair Bar for um, back knee and chest acne because I think um, it's a keratolytic, so it is exfoliating. It has that licorice, which is soothing, um, and I think it's very helpful. But I think um, typically it's some kind of a contact issue. Um, melatonin. Okay, you say melatonin can help in mel can help in melatonin production. So I think I'm confused by this question. You say melatonin can help in melatonin production, which actually what I said is if you take too much melatonin, you can throw off your own production. So I just want to clarify that. So taking low dose two to three um, milligrams is fine. But if you take more than that, you can actually hamper your own body's feedback loop and not make it. Um, is it safe or beneficial for children with eczema or scarring from deep wounds? I don't think that melatonin is going to help um, the children with the eczema or the deep wounds. I think that's a complete, these are very separate issues. Uh, and typically children make um, very adequate amounts of melatonin. So um, it certainly can help with a good night's rest for people who um, have low melatonin. Or if you are in a situation where you and your family have traveled, say, 
to Italy for vacation or something, and now the light is different and it's difficult to adjust, I would use a little, you know, two milligram or like half of a gummy for your child, perhaps maybe to help them there. But in general, the eczema is definitely a microbiome issue and also an inflammation issue and totally different protocol. Let's see, on the cursor through here, I just noticed that I had a cursor. Oh, and you're welcome, Lisa. Oh, I get palpitations if I take melatonin. Is it because I have lupus? Um, I'd rather take valerian root tea with lavender. Um, so yeah, really good point. Like you, Sherry, there are some people that um, are just not meant for certain supplements. And so the second you have an adverse reaction like that, um, you certainly want to stop taking it. But I think when you have an autoimmune disease like lupus, everything you try, whether it be herbal or prescription, needs to be run by your doctor. So um, I want you to be really careful because with lupus, as you know, you're so sensitive and your body overreacts to so many things that we just want to be careful. So um, again, always talk to your doctor first, but especially if you have an autoimmune disease like lupus. Um, do you think a food sensitivity test is a good starting point for yourself or a client to do the dietary elimination in order to obtain better nutrition? Okay. Um, I do use a lot of food sensitivity testing in my, my private practice. Absolutely. Here's what I would say, though. For the people who don't have the money to invest in that, um, I do really, really well with an elimination diet with my clients. Um, so we'll do like two weeks of really, really strict elimination of every potential allergen you could imagine. It's not easy, but it's two weeks, right? You get through it. And then one at a time, we bring a food back, a food group or a food back. Um, and it becomes very clear very quickly what your triggers are. Now, that said, certain people are just uber sensitive. Um, and we just have, you know, it seems like they're sensitive to everything. You know, I've had people who are down to like four foods is all they can eat. For them, there's typically some kind of a leaky gut situation going on where the food sensitivity testing really does help them. Um, if the elimination diet is not, is not enough. But I don't think everyone has to invest in that. Um, elimination diet is beautiful. Oh, okay, where do you find information on probiotic strains in relation to genes and symptoms? Um, it's such a specialized area of study. There's not that many of a strain at this point. So I would say um, probiotic strains and symptoms, there's a, you know some really great resources out there. And I can't think of off the top of my head, but... Um, that's something I can put on my to-do list is um, there's a website that can direct you about that. I'm just writing myself a note for my follow-up. Um, but in terms of genes, um, that's going to be very much a one-on-one -on -one with a practitioner trained in that. And that science is not strong. So you're probably better off looking at symptoms because your genes are just like a little roadmap, but your symptoms tell us which actually, what's actually happening. So I know, for example, um, the Claire... Um, probiotic line, they have, it feels like something for everything um, that you could possibly complain about. So it, it, that's a really great brand and I would look there. Ginger, do you have any preference, when it comes to supplements, um, do you have any preferences over, uh, it, whether it be in tablets, whether it be in capsule, whether it be in gummy, whether it be in liquid? I mean, there's so many ways to to get supplements, including patches. I mean, it's crazy. Yep. The option. Um, in your experience, have you found that one is, is better absorbed? Yeah, I think uh, that's a really good question. It depends on the supplement, for sure, um, because not all supplements can come in all all of those forms. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, glutathione is like our master antioxidant and a lot of people take it just to boost immunity. Um, it helps with energy, et cetera. It is so hard to absorb that I think like the really the only good one is the one you squirt under your tongue. And that's really great. Um, and the same thing can be true for people with B12 deficiency. Um, but you have to be very careful with the forms of B12 that you take. It has to be right for you. Um, at the same time, magnesium, which is great for muscle aches and pains among, you know, a thousand other things, is absorbed beautifully through the skin. So I think anytime you can take something through the skin, you should, because it's, it, when you take a supplement through the skin, it spares your liver the first pass, as we call it. And so our liver can get stressed by taking too many medications and supplements. So if you can find something that can be done transdermally, I think that's great. The ones under the tongue have good absorption. When it comes between a tablet and a capsule, um, mm -hmm. tablets are typically harder to break down and are not as well absorbed. So like when you see the vitamin D, I always go for the little gel or the liquid um, over those tablets. And it has a lot to do with stomach acid production and your ability, especially as we age, to break things down. 
And that's why a lot of times we suggest taking your supplements with a meal because then you're releasing your hydrochloric acid and it can be broken down better. Um, there's very few supplements that should be taken on an empty stomach um, for that reason. That makes sense. And they have um, magnesium patches. I've never yes. seen that. Yeah. Oh, it's good to know. I, I've never seen them. I love um, Magnificent Magne. What's it called? Um, there's a great brand of magnesium that comes in an oil, a cream. I mean, all kinds of transdermal applications. I've never used the patch, but it's great, especially before bed. Very, very relaxing. Okay, I see. Um, what are your supplement suggestions for treating treating teenage acne? Um, same uh, teenage versus adult really is the same. Um, it's definitely going to be a hormone trigger. So we're going to look at the, the dim sulforaphane. So getting those cruciferous vegetables in would be great. Um, omega-3, definitely great um, under the advisement of, you know, getting the okay from your doctor. And as long as they're not on um, oral contraceptive. Those are my favorites. How about dermatitis? Um, boy, dermatitis is a totally different um, classification. So I, I have another lecture I give on um, nutrition for inflammatory skin conditions. And I actually take each um, segment and I talk about it separately because they are so different. Like the treatment for eczema is different than rosacea. Um, and dermatitis, unfortunately, it tends to be like of unknown origin typically, right? We call it dermatitis when we really don't know what the heck that irritation is. And it's almost always an inflammatory skin condition and it almost always has ties to gut health. So I think when I'm thinking about dermatitis, I'm going to think I'm going to be looking at diet. I'm going to be looking at um, microbiome. So are they eating a diet that supports a healthy microbiome? Have they been on high dose antibiotics for some Lyme disease or something where they've destroyed their microbiome and it really needs to be restored? Um, have they had some kind of an illness that has depleted um, their gut microbiome? So there's a lot of things to think about. Also, um, people who have um, like mast cell disorders, where they have overactive immune systems, um, will have more dermatitis. And so it's very individual. I, I don't think it's something for an esthetician um, or even a, a nutritionist. You know, I'll typically be working with a doctor on dermatitis to figure out cause, because there's always something deeper. Yeah, agreed. Always. And there is, um, you know, for a takeaway, for a, a a, a client that is experiencing acne that had to choose the one thing to remove from their diet to see the quicker, you know, the most efficient results. Would you go with sugar? Would you go with milk? Well, like, I mean, obviously reducing everything that could be problematic, but if you were kind of tossed between, they say, I can take one thing out. Like I'll do one thing. Would you tell them to remove sugar from their diet? Would you say, Hey, get the milk out of your diet, get all that out. Boy, I, I want to have a tie between sugar and milk, but um, I'm actually, because I don't think people drink as much milk as they eat sugar. So I'm picking sugar. Um, and I'll tell you why, because sugar, like there's two things going on, right? So um, sugar, typically it's the glycemic response that is triggering both the, it can trigger, trigger the cortisol, but it can also trigger um, your levels of glucose or blood sugar, which has been tightly, tightly connected to acne. So for me, I'm going to pick the sugar. It's so um, you know prevalent in the standard American diet. And I think people are having a lot more sugar than milk. So sugar. <laughs> All right. They had to pick. Um, and that is, that is, you know, it is one of those things where I think a lot of people forget um, the hidden sugars and even hidden milk and hidden dairy. You know, like people don't realize when you eat milk chocolate, it's not the same as eating dark chocolate. You're getting dairy in that. And I think so often, um, I, you know, I forget about it all the time too. You eat something thinking it's okay. And then you're like, oh, I forgot about all the sugar in there. Yeah. What about natural sugars? Um, I know that they're going to respond a little bit differently in the body. So would you have a person uh, maybe cut out natural? Would they stay away from strawberries and other types of fruits that could have natural sugars in them? Or is that okay? Great point. Um, so I think that when, of course, a banana will increase, uh, have a glycemic response, just like, um, you know, table sugar, but not just like it. So if you eat the whole fruit, for example, then you also get fiber and you get carbohydrates. So you get other compounds um, within that piece of fruit. So the lowest glycemic fruits would be berries. And so if someone really wants to eat fruit and they're, they're worried about sugar um, because of their acne or their health in another way, berries are really low, low glycemic and they're high fiber. So I would say similar- All berries um, or just some berries? All berries. Okay, okay. All berries. 
Um, but, and then um, a pear is another good choice, right? So a pear is loaded with fiber. So yes, it does have some sugar, but the fiber really tempers that glycemic response. Right. Different from a glass of orange juice, which is just pure sugar, right? right. Um, a craisin. You know, you know what they've done to a cranberry to make it a craisin? You don't want to eat a craisin. <laughs> that is just coated with the sugar. A raisin, so dried fruit. They take away all the moisture. It still does have some fiber, but boy, is it high in sugar. So I say berries are your go-to. Um, and then really high fiber fruits like pears are also great. That makes sense. That makes mm -hmm. sense. Good. Um, and you know, are there a lot of, um, is there a listing of nutritionists that work with, because I think you're, you are definitely a hybrid in the sense that you're very tuned into aesthetics and estheticians and what estheticians do. Many nutritionists aren't necessarily tied into the arena that we work in. Right. They may know about it. They may even go get facials, but they don't put a lot of their focus into it. So, you know, for an esthetician who wants to team up with someone in her area, how does she go about finding someone who would have the knowledge that you have? Is there a resource base that she can look into to start doing some cross marketing? Yeah. So here's what I would say. Um, I don't know very many um, nutritionists who specialize in skin. I have to say it's kind of an unusual combo. However, I think, um, so I'm a certified nutrition specialist. In order to be a CNS, we have to have either a master's or a PhD, and we have to have this additional training in personalized um, and integrated nutrition. So um, registered dietitians are also, you know, they're nutritionists as well, but they, they're at a bachelor's level degree and they don't do the biochem that we do. So I feel like they're not making the gut, skin, that biochemistry connections that a CNS does. So I would go to, um, the ANA.org, um, find a CNS. And so there's a list. Yeah, but that's a CNS certified nutrition specialist. Um, I'm not saying that an RD couldn't do the job, but most don't have the in-depth biochemistry. And so if you understand biochemistry, you can make the connections um, so much easier than the people who only have rudimentary biochemistry. Right. And that does help, you know, if you've got, and I know I treated a lot of acne clients um, in the nineties and I did have, you know, dermatologists that I would send them to, but it was always the same thing over and over and over. It was when they had to have a medication that was kind of all they wanted to do. And I did know some dietitians, but none that were on that level that would have been so nice to be able to send my clients to. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They're, they're great for many things, but I think you want someone who's really good at the chemistry piece. Agree. 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 Well, gosh, this is awesome. I learned so much. Thank you so much for doing oh, this. I really enjoyed it. Thank you all for being with us. Um, and I want to make sure people don't forget this. Um, if you are watching this, make sure that you enter to win one of the Glycan lotions from Dermamed Solutions. This is the 10% glycolic. Excellent for acne prone skin. This is something I use. I like glycolic lotions. My daughter uses glycolic lotions. Three of you are going to win this. And the way you enter to win is you take a photo of you taking this class. Go ahead and share what you thought of the class. I know you loved it. So go ahead and share some insight. Let everybody else know that you took the class from Ginger on the holistic approach to acne. Make sure you use your hashtag Eastie Loves Derma Med because that's how we're going to look to pick the winners. So post a photo of you. Make sure it's you taking the class, use the hashtag EC Loves Dermamed, and three of you are going to win the Glide 10. And then also there is a promotion that involves their, um, their pro size glycolic 10, which is for your back bar, as well as their pro size glycolic gel lotion, um, glycolic gel cleanser, which by the way, I got my daughter on as well. Um, that's the duo we have for $20 off with free shipping. And that runs till May 5th, I think you said. I mean, May 4th, May 5th, May 5th somewhere. Pretty May 5th. sure. So you want to make sure you take advantage of that. I want to thank everybody for watching. Make sure you post on the page. If you have a question that we did not answer, um, we're going to go ahead and have this uploaded. Amber's really good. She'll have it done by tonight. We'll share that on the page if you need to ask questions. Ginger's in the EC, Tracy's in the EC. We can find out the answers for you. And she also gave me your email address. So if they have other questions, they can send that in. Um, Ginger, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Learned so much. And I think it was a very valuable class. I'm so glad. My pleasure. Thank you, guys. All right. Thank thanks again for watching. We will talk to you all soon in the Zoom room. Bye, guys.